case you missed it, and don't go to the flicks that often, France's famous little corporal, who is actually average height for the age, is coming to a big screen shortly. Starring the bloke who played the Joker, in courtesy of the producer of the likes of Alien and Blade Runner. Admission from moi, despite the surety the movie will historically be flimsy. I'm highly likely to get temporary retina damage from the CGI glare. Sure, I'll be in attendance. In a tenuous yet interesting quirky story, which may be all it is, there happens to be a link between the last resting place of the ostracised Emperor of the French and the French settlement at Banks Peninsula, New Zealand, Canterbury's oldest town. Seaside Akaroa, founded in 1840. The place where a bomber plonked itself into during World War II. From the title, a thumbnail, not hard to guess what my next utterance was going to be in terms of the long bow that connects Napoleon tenuously with Nouvelle Zealand. Willow trees, droopy drawers that soon went 90 kilometres inland, making Christchurch seem more like old blighty for the homesick fresh off the boat palms. When you next wander drunkenly the banks of the River Avon in Christchurch post-boozing, stagger what is colloquially called the Strip, after five too many, see iconic photos of Christchurch, on an odd day the Eastley isn't slicing locals in two, before calling a taxi and try to engage in conversation with the driver you couldn't understand even if you were sober, Take time to locate and read this plaque by the river's edge. Okay, fair call. Maybe not. And let's just take some time to read it now. The weeping willows of Christchurch to commemorate a Francois Le Lievre, who first came to New Zealand on the French whaling ship Neil in 1838. After landing in Akaroa, he planted weeping willow cuttings taken from Napoleon's grave on the island of St Helena. There is strong evidence to suggest uh, that the first willows planted on the banks of the Avon River grew from these cuttings taken from these trees. The French had certainly been rolling in and out of New Zealand earlier than the 1840s. The itinerants, chasing whales mostly, the odd settler wanting to put down roots. Some of those whaling fleets even came with French Navy corvettes. On board one of those whaling vessels, called the Neil, or N-I-L, Nile in English, was the forementioned Le Lievre. Psst, they forgot to point out his original duty on board. His first of three visits to Akaroa was... Don't for God's sake tell Greenpeace. He was a harpooner. The sign outside the Akaroa Cemetery gives us the same broad rundown and a date, 1837. Lyube Hill French Cemetery. The graves were shaded by weeping willows thought to have been grown from a cutting taken from trees around Napoleon's grave at St Helena and introduced to New Zealand by a Francois Le Lievre, who arrived in Akaroa on board the whaler, Neil, in 1837. The first willows planted on the banks of the River Avon in Christchurch were grown from cuttings taken from these trees. In case you were imagining the Akaroa of today, versus Akaroa in the mid-1800s, 1845 to be exact, this painting will, what's the term, paint a picture. Le Lievera was immured with New Zealand, specifically Akaroa and Banks Peninsula as a whole, going back to France twice with travel brochures. The second visit he struck a deal with a local Maori to purchase the entire peninsula. On Frankie's third and final trip before planting his roots, going forth in biblical terms before contraception was a thing to have four sons and five daughters 
lack of decent board games is doubtless played a role. He and his boat load of 82 French settlers on board the Comte de Paris arrived in Ekaroa in 1840 to find Mary had done the dirty. One of those passengers being the supremely fertile future Mrs. Lelievre. It's a wonder she didn't supplement the family income by selling her eggs at the gate. Anyway, the Froggies found the Union Jack fluttering over the harbour. As a French descendant, I get to say the term frog with impunity. And a newly constructed magistrate's building, written in English. No annoying genders. It was a closely run thing, though. The British frigate Britomart, having only beaten the, the Comte de Paris by a week and a half, the British had finally stopped umming and ahhing over New Zealand as a whole, established a sovereignty over forgotten outposts like Akaroa. Rather than telling the settlers to piss off and find your own colony, they welcomed them, granting every new family five acres to call home. Their descendants would go on to have annual get-togethers even today. Think they're lucky stars they are not living in the dystopian French as a second language city, the Paris of today. As I've covered in this underrated video, link in the description, Alexi David overstretched a British government of the day meant New Zealand was quite literally up for grabs at this juncture. Francis was given the title of King's Commissioner of all he could see, which frankly wasn't a hell of a lot, as this painting from the same era attests. So to recap that story, on his third voyage out here, 1840, Liliev travelled on board the Comte de Paris, provisioned at St Helena in mid-Atlantic, where he flogged a cutting from a willow hanging over Napoleon's grave. It also happened to be the favourite pondering spot for him as well. Hold on a sec here. What about the Neil in 1837? All that signage. And take your pick, people. Neil or Perry, as you're soon to find out, Canterbury isn't even the only place in New Zealand to lay a claim to being the home to Napoleonic willows have spookily similar stories. There's allegedly offspring in Nelson as well. That's before I get to Australia and the US of A, etc. Starting in NZ though, let's travel to the top of the South Island before addressing Reader's Digest style overseas tales. This gentleman, early pioneer of the Upper South, a surveyor, businessman and run holder, Scotsman John Tinline, Tinline was on a vessel in 1839 to New Zealand, which made a pit stop at St Helena, where he took some slips from the graveside and preserved them by sticking them into potatoes. By the way, as soon as he died in 1821, the French authorities partitioned the British to allow them to reinter his remains back to Paris. This did occur in 1825. Despite the St Helena grave now being empty, tourists and souvenir hunters plagued the island site, partly as a term of endearment and partly to stop a petty theft, the French placed a guard beside the tomb for decades. That's one of them moping around, wondering why the hell he joined the army in the first place. Those alleged Nelson specimens are said to be the ones you see today, planted beside the Maitai River and Brook Stream, when it's not in flood. That's just 10 days a year. This seems mighty unlikely, given a tin line didn't even travel to New Zealand directly. After leaving the UK in 1839, he joined his brother in Adelaide first, then settled in Wellington in 1840 and didn't set foot in Nelson until 1842, meaning he would have had to have that shoot in his possession for a minimum of two and a half years, overlooking Wellington entirely to finally offload them. Holes are plenty in this story, which has another tie-in with our next destination. Oi, oi, oi. Oh, God. 
As is this fiercely proud New Zealand made site, I happen to be inherently lazy also, like everyone else, the eight other billion humans. I am fleetingly travelling across the Tasman, going to address the Murray River willows in South Australia only. Other than saying, the other places denoted follow the same origin story as Akaroa, almost entirely with miles less veracity. Remember I mentioned Tin Lines Bro, and the Murray River Willows are said to have originated from him. Or in other renditions, his brother in New Zealand sent him some from Nelson. Historical version of dog chasing its tail. Speaking of which, here's one of those crappy stateside sampler selections of chocolates to pick through. The most notable of these being the one said to be sheltering a George Washington's grave. That's before the ones said to be in England, South Africa, etc, etc, etc. To summarise, that poor willow tree in St Helena, no wonder it needed a bloody guard. You don't have to be a card-carrying member of the Skeptic Society to come to the conclusion not all these renditions can be true. A local rumour inflating the interest in a garden variety shrubbery became a story and then it gets into print next thing a plaque was being erected to the now fact still of the supposed willows dotting the glow Akaroa gets close in terms of historical record there's for example a report from a botanist in 1864 I came across talking about willow trees in NZ in general that appointed to Takamatua, then German Bay, close to Akaroa, being the site of the first planting in 1840. The evidence is therefore very strong on the Akaroa front. As with subjects with no definitive way of proving X or Y, it becomes the equivalent, though, of arguing whether Superman would beat Batman. Still today, arguing on the internet with strangers is normal as a bloke with a huge codger swimming a hundred butterfly in the women's division. Here the fourth in the comments section, ye defenders of their local willows, and speaking of trees, not only do you have a video about a trony bomber crew crashing into the middle of the township of Akaroa in WW2, another one to watch about the formative years of New Zealand, there's also a video about the world's most remotest tree down on the Campbell Islands. More trees! Well, technically just one. Links for all three are in the description. I'm rather out of practice, frankly, so don't expect the best standard ending. <coughs> Bye for now. Cheers to my loyal and patient followers.